before the applause. Before the headlines. Before he unleashed his talent full force and created artwork that takes your breath away. Artwork that rivals classic monuments. Before all of this, he was a shy and introverted child who was shunned and bullied. The other children taunted me and they called me dirty names and they would say things like, the devil gonna get you, and it would be a whole circle of children that I loved and that I thought were my friends. It made me feel like I was not loved. I always wanted to be loved as a child. I just wanted to, everybody to like me. In his community, no one had ever seen an infant do the things that he could do. He was an 11-month-old super baby. At 11 months old, my mother saw that that was the only thing that kept me quiet because I would cry because my brothers and father was always drawing. I couldn't get up to the table and draw like them, so she noticed that the only thing that would keep me quiet, she said, mm, I think he wants to draw. So she saved some money she had hidden in the cookie jar and bought me a, a high chair that turned over into a, a drawing table. My father didn't want her spending money on anything like that, so she sneaked and pretended that she was buying me a high chair to eat out of, to hold me up. But in turn, she was drawing me a draw, my first drawing table. And I started drawing, and I, she said she never had to peep out of me after that. As he became a toddler and advanced to kindergarten, his talent continued to blossom, but to other children, he was strange, weird. I felt rejected because in the neighborhood I was different. Alone with no friends, he channeled his emotions into his art. He created these characters with these fascinating eyes. I saw Diana Ross in the Supremes when I was in elementary school in the sixth grade for the first time. Diana Ross's eyes were so big, I just started creating little characters out of them. Because you have to remember now, back in those days, your parents didn't talk to you, they just beat you for whatever reason. And I was always the one who got the most beatings, who got the most punishments. Somehow I would be on punishment for literally two, three months in the summer, which means I never got a chance to go outside. So I learned to divert that energy whenever mom would come home with groceries, or especially the meat that was wrapped in the white butcher paper. I would learn to draw, and I would draw on every inch of it. I started doing these big Donnie characters when I was about 11 years old, and they were escapism for me. They became my friends. As I created them more and more, the more real they became, the more personal they became, the more they began to speak back to me. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what I lived through because I lived in such a turmoil environment. But by the time I was 13, I did this one. And this is one of my favorites. Originally from Pittsburgh, California, he and his siblings lived with their parents in housing projects. In his teen years, Ronald left home to explore the world. He dabbled in modeling, acting, and singing, but always returned to his first love, art. As an emerging artist, he connected with Motown and orbited among a galaxy of stars. I saw all of them, Donna Ross, Billy D. Williams, Face to Face, Smokey, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, um, Barry Gordy himself, Hazel, all the Jackson Five. Michael was a clown. He was a comical genius. He could have been a comedian if he had not been so good of a, dancing and a, a dancer and singer and entertainer. Michael liked to play practical jokes. The first day I met him, uh, we were at the studio. I was delivering a painting for Frank Wilson, one of the great producers at Motown. This did a painting of his son. So um, I was delivering a painting, and Joe Jackson happened to be at the studio. And Joe Jackson saw me delivering the painting to Frank. And he said, Hey, Ron, come in here. My boys are here recording. And I said, The Jackson Five? He said, Yeah, it's my boys. I want you to meet them. And he introduced them to me one by one. And Michael was the last one to come out of the 
recording studio out of the sound room at Booth. And um, he took his earphones off and came in and he saw my work and he was impressed. And he said, you've got to teach me how to do this. He said, we saw your work on TV. I had won a contest in Hollywood uh, called Someone Who Cares. And um, they highlighted my artwork. And Michael said, we saw your artwork, but we didn't get a chance to see you. And we thought you were a 53-year-old white man. And he looked with big eyes and he said, you're young like us and you're black. He said, you've got to teach me lessons. i got to learn how to do this artwork. You've got to teach me. He said, I've always wanted to be an artist. Please, please, please. I said, Michael, I can't teach you art lessons because you don't, it's not your house. Where am I going to teach you at? You're a kid like me, you know, you're just a teenager. And he said, ah, oh, you could come teach me. I said, no, 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 no. So he kept calling me. And after around the fifth time when he called me, I said, he's serious. So I went up and Joe and Catherine relented and let me start teaching Michael art lessons. This chapter of his life was the best of times and also the worst. There was the bliss of Motown, followed by Hell on Earth. He left Hollywood and returned to his hometown, where cruel people in his neighborhood did despicable things to him. They would come in my apartment and take things out and come and cook food. Uh, they'd burn me in the arm with the pots and... Just do horrific things, you know. But I was used to abuse. I was always getting beat up in the neighborhood and where I grew up in. And um, brothers would beat me up, um, just make me tough. They didn't like me being timid. Um, I just got punched around a lot with the kids in the neighborhood. And, you know, and my mother and father beat me a lot. So. so I was used to getting beat, so I thought it was, I was a punching man for everybody. I just felt like that's what was supposed to happen to me. A tortured man. A struggling artist in the darkness, teaching became a bright light. And there was this one little boy with a behavior problem who became a blessing in disguise. Because of that little boy, Ronald met an angel. Um, I didn't feel like my family was treating me good, although I wouldn't, I don't think they would, they didn't think they were. That was just where we grew up, we were dysfunctional. Um, I was thinking about committing suicide, and so I wasn't telling anybody um, up until the time I had decided how I was going to end my life and how I was going to take my life. I met an old gentleman from Tuskegee, Alabama. He had a son I was working at after school center that I helped to found. And um, the kid said, you got to go tell his father that he's acting bad because he's bad. And this old man saw me instantly and said, I'm going to be your dad. You need a father. You need a father figure. I'm going to be that figure. So that, from that moment on, he said, I want you to take my son, and uh, he's going to live with you, and I want you to help me raise him. And I took Art. His name was Art. I took him in under my wing, and he loved me like a little brother, and he protected me. He was crazy, um, bold, real bold, like an old soul. His father was 65 or close to 70 when I met him, and Art was about eight. So my attention went off of me and went on to him. So I wanted to help educate him and help and give him a different type of life. But his father would come over and pay my bills because I wasn't thinking about paying bills. I was still contemplating suicide. And I kind of got better and I started creating again. And I was in the kitchen painting. I always painted in my kitchen. And Pops came over. I called him Pops. His name was Chester McAfee. And he came over and he said, I just paid the rent for you, son, and your life bill, he said. And um, we got to get the phone bill paid. I said, yeah, so I'm going to pay the phone bill today. And he said, what you doing? I said, I'm in the kitchen drawing. So he came in the kitchen and saw me painting, and he just blew him away. He said, you got this kind of talent. I got a son that could paint. You're an artist. And he said, wow. And so that began my relationship with getting enough nerve to go back to Hollywood and reacquaint and reacquaint myself with the stars and stuff like Michael. And he really helped me get to where I am today. They were leaving me behind, and they were the only family I felt. I had a good connection with my real family, Karen. I don't want to mislead anyone to thinking that I didn't. We were dysfunction, dysfunctional like most families in the 60s and 70s. But this man and his family brought so much more love to me. They paid attention to what I was doing. And he paid a lot of detail to who I was, and he took care of me. And when he said he was coming to visit, 
on a visit to Tuskegee, where, where his family was from, the Macon County. I said, you're not leaving me. I had a t-shirt on and some blue jeans and some tennis shoes, some sneakers at the time. And it was in 86, and I got in the car with him, and I came to Alabama, and I fell in love with him. Just that abrupt trip to Tuskegee was in 1986, meaning as of 2016, it's been 30 years. No, it seems like yesterday. You know, they're both gone, um, Pops and Art. They're both gone. Um, they're gone on to heaven. And I, um, I miss them, but Tuskegee still reminds me so much of them. And I have a kinship here because of them. That family became his new family, and he adopted their hometown as his new home. Living here has been another tale of the best of times and also the worst. One night, his house on the lake became a house of horrors. Well, some people thought I was rich or felt that I had a lot of money on me, which I would never keep a lot of cash in my house or on me. And they came in to rob me and they came in to, to harm me. Uh, I kept calling the police department and nobody in the dispatcher at the time told me that um, there was only two police on duty and there was nothing she could do and she hung the phone up in my face. By the time the gunman had gotten in, and I had gotten out of the house and broke my arm, my arm, sculpting arm, my right arm in three places when I slipped off the south and second floor balcony in a rainstorm. Didn't have any clothes on except some Levi's and a t-shirt. And um, I ran through the lake, around the lake area, until I went to a house and got some help and called police. And I thought that whenever, I'm a giving spirit person. I love everything to be peaceful and happy and that's just not the way the world is. So because of that bad experience, happened to me. I never want to even live in Tuskegee again. But um, at times I move back and at times I get out, but I've never gone back over there again near the lake where the house is because there's too many bad memories. An artist of his magnitude is a gift to the world and he travels extensively accommodating clients. Former Birmingham Mayor Richard Arrington commissioned Ronald to sculpt a statue that would memorialize the civil rights foot soldiers. Basically, it's telling the story through art, and that's what makes it such a blessing. And it gives the history of what happened, and so it is amazing. It's amazing that he used his talent to tell the story of the Civil Rights Movement. And so, that's a true blessing. Yeah, they tell me that close to 18 million people in 20 years have viewed it. He also turned to Ronald to sculpt a statue honoring a singer who grew up in Birmingham and left to give Motown some of its greatest hits. Can I have a talk with you? Eddie Kendricks has been a big part of Ronald's life at various stages. He encountered Eddie at Motown. Well, I knew the temptations. I had ran into him. I didn't know him personally, but I ran into him several times before I did the statues. And Eddie Kendricks was the first famous person who stopped and took the time to tell me that I was a great artist. And long before that, as a teenager, he emulated the star at talent shows. Ooh. The largest assembled collection of Ronald McDowell artwork is on display here. Tourists from everywhere visit this place to connect with Alabama's musical treasures. Ronald McDowell is the official artist for the Alabama Music Hall of Fame. The portraits are absolutely wonderful. They are a very important part of what we do because uh, we, you have to honor your inductees in a special way and what better way than having a portrait made of them. And each one of them, you know, they have their own personality but yet they blend together and make the uh, gallery room just a beautiful room to showcase 
these artists. And there's not a person that doesn't come in that doesn't say, wow, when they see them. In 2006, he was awarded an honorary doctorate, and since then, he has been Dr. Ronald McDowell. He has captured on canvas the most iconic celebrities in the world, and he gets just as much joy when he paints or draws everyday people. If you think he's bitter from all the pain, wrong. And if you think he's big-headed from all the praise, wrong again. He's the nicest guy with the kindest heart. And he wants all children to have what he missed as a child. Acceptance, approval, encouragement. Recently, he was a special instructor assigned to two classrooms. In this class, he used numbers to inspire creativity. And in this class, geometric shapes. Now I want you to... Um Come in the middle and do the same thing, triangle first. This seven morphed into this. One hundred morphed into a cartoon character. And this elaborate art started as the number twelve. He was part of a teaching unit that integrated math and art into curriculum for seventh and eighth grade students attending middle school in Tuskegee. I actually enjoy this art class because he talks to us more about art. He tells us about life lessons. He teaches us how to draw. No matter how bad we draw, he tells us there's no mistakes in his art class. He teaches us like everything we need to know. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. This has been very fun. It's exciting and very exquisite for me because he taught us how to draw things that I never knew I could draw. He taught me I had an inner gift that I didn't know I had. Students in the other class also graded him A+. Plus. This is all I'm looking for. It's very simple. See, little China? Very simple. See? You can do the texture, like what I'm doing. Um, it has meant a whole lot to me that Mr. McDowell would come and spend time with us to teach us his art and make us and help us improve. Because the first time I seen something he drew in sculptures and stuff, I was like, wow. It like really blew my mind. And I was really thinking about taking art because there's many careers out there that you could actually do to achieve something in life with, with drawing. I think that every child who's born in the world because they come from God, and God was the first artist and the greatest artist. He instills a little bit of that art that comes through him to every child. But as we grow older, we get nervous and start thinking, well, I can't draw this, I can't do that. You know, people tell you, you can't do this, you can't do that. So the first thing I teach when I'm teaching art is to eliminate the element of fear. And though he was once starved for love, this is no longer true. He has genuine friends, ardent admirers, and great relationships with his sisters and brothers. My family embraced me as I got older. And when they saw that I was serious, they began to get more serious. And when Michael Jackson called me and asked me to help him with some work on Thriller, then um, it changed everything. In the neighborhood, um, people, the word got out, my mother, who he talked to, and called about five times trying to get me involved. She started looking at me and my work a little differently, and so did my family. But I'm to just say something, my family was a very good family, they are a good family, and they're always supportive of me. And right now, though I'm not in California with most of them, they know where I am. We talk almost every day on the phone. We keep in contact with each other. We love each other. My mother was a very good mother, and she instilled in us, and she made sure that when we got older that we would take care of each other. She taught us that all we had was each other, and that's why she taught us to love one another, and we still do. My name is Dr. Tookie Taylor, and I'm a huge fan of Dr. Ronald McDowell's artwork. I'm wearing a, a jean outfit that he painted for me several years ago. I wear it when he goes to do art shows sometimes to uh, market for him. When he was six years old, he sold his first art for five cents. It was an illustration of Mickey Mouse. Today, 
He is a master with phenomenal skills. Invited to teach art at prestigious Tuskegee University. He also was chosen by Birmingham stakeholders to sculpt a statue honoring Nina Milianico, a pioneer in the fields of law and city government. Miss Nina also was a champion for civil rights. Well, first of all, he has a God-given talent. He has not been trained, uh, had any formal training. It's just something that comes through him to be able to capture the spirit of someone uh, like Miss Nina. And, you know, to have a woman who maybe not that many people know of her right now, but having served with her and know the, the energy and the life force that she had about herself, and to see this casting of her is just simply amazing uh, as it all comes together. And in Montgomery, where Dr. Martin Luther King led a ministry and a movement, there is no statue of Dr. King. But there will be a magnificent statue honoring this civil rights leader after Ronald McDowell moves from sketch to sculpting. I believe Dr. McDowell is not only well suited, he is the only person suited in my mind at this time for because, uh, for one, the gift that the Lord has blessed him with. Uh, I, I know uh, Dr. McDowell personally, and I'm very honored to know him because not only does he have a gift, he's the one who freely uses his gift. And you can feel the compassion and the passion he has in utilizing his gift. Uh, I, I'm excited about that because oftentimes you can tell a store-bought cake from a homemade cake. I believe we're going to get a homemade cake when it comes to what he's doing because he's going to put a lot of love in it and he has the gift to do it. And I know I've often heard people say, uh, I've got the gift and I've got to use it. Well, he's one of those persons who has that gift, and not only does he have to use it, he has been using it for a long time. He's a very gifted person, uh, and I can see in his spirit, he's a very loving person, and, uh, and he would give to a project such as this the passion necessary in order to make sure that we do it right. The statue will stand at the Legacy Center near Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, which is close to the state capitol in Montgomery. And what better place to place this memorial than in front of a place where there was a movement uh, back during that time and now we're moving toward uh, something that we call the Forward March Movement. People get ready, there's a train a coming. As an artist, he's right up there with the very best. His pencil illustrations are incredibly lifelike. His portraits are museum quality. His whimsical artworks have a style that's pure Ronald McDowell. His montages blend multiple images into a single painting. He uses brushes, paints, and palettes to tell complex stories on canvas. His abstract art is also amazing. He designs commemorative coins and with his busts, and statues, he ensures that sacred history is preserved forever. Hard to believe he started life in poverty and despair and has come this far. He's a national treasure with a stunning body of work that commands attention and has earned for him respect. You know, when I was coming up, I had offers to sing for record companies. Um, I had offers to model, offers to act, um, but I thought that art was so important in, our, in the African American community that I was willing to sacrifice all my other talents that God had endowed me with for the arts, for the visual arts, for the paintings, the sculpturings, the, um, the visual arts, as I said, and I would want everyone to know that art is important because it tells a story of who we are. And it tells the story of who I am. And it tells that story for time indefinite. Because people treasure art. I treasure art. I love other artists' work. It inspires me still today. And I made those sacrifices for that reason. That I wanted my art to be the most important thing in the legacy that I can leave behind. I hope that with my work, that people will look at the work that the artists are doing, the contemporary artists that are doing in my day and age, and say these were artists also, and they were great artists. And I hope that my artwork leaves a legacy for people to understand who I was and who the people around me were and what affected my life and my culture and helped to shape me as the artist that I have become. 
Look, not only could other people not deny his talent, he could not de deny his talent. And, and, and that's the thing, when, you, when, some, when a gift like that has been given to you, nobody can beat it out of you. You can't give it away. You can't, you can't stop doing what you do. That's like asking a bird to stop flying. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's some, a, a life force inside of you that you have no control over. And when your hands go to work on uh, creating something, it just automatic. your hands just automatically know what to do. And I hope the young people remember that it's not what you gain from the world, it's what you give the world that really counts. But while